Do you spend hours in your head thinking about something that happened, could have happened, or might happen? Do you ask others what to do so you don't make a mistake? Welcome to the Playing It Safe podcast. I am Dr. Z, your host. I am a clinical psychologist, an author, and a person that is super passionate about sharing with you science-based skills to overcome any type of fear-based struggles. Who doesn't experience fear? Who doesn't play it safe? In this show, we will discuss how fear-based reactions happen in day-to-day life, how playing it safe behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like, how you can put into action solid tips from behavioral science to get unstuck from worries, fears, obsessions, and anxieties, and how you can start doing what works, what matters, and what you care about. Behavioral science doesn't have to be boring. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Z. For those of you who are new to the podcast, my full name is Patricia Esperanza Zurita Oña. I know, I have a super long name. (laughs) If you have been following my work or if you are new to my work, you know that I am super passionate about sharing skills from behavioral science, in particular acceptance and commitment training or acceptance and commitment therapy for fear-based struggles. And one of the things that happens when we are dealing with any type of a fear-based emotion is that we narrow our actions. We play it safe. We do what fear tells us to do. Sometimes that is very adaptive. If you are jogging in the street and you see a car driving fast, You may have a fear-based emotion. Your mind may think, what if that car hits me? And you may pause. And you may wait until the car passes, and then you will continue jogging. In that particular context, in that particular situation, your playing it safe move was very effective. But what happens if you play it safe every single time you experience a fear-based emotion without checking how it works in your life? For example, if I am afraid of public speaking and I get an invitation to give a workshop in London and I am really, really excited about this presentation, But then my mind wonders, Patricia, what if you mess up? What if you don't know what you're talking about? What if your presentation doesn't go well? What if people don't show up to your workshop? And instead of holding lightly those thoughts, I write an email to the organizers of this workshop And I tell them that I cannot make it because it's quite likely I am going to be in Bolivia. That is also a playing it safe move. But in that particular situation, that playing it safe move is not effective, is not helpful because it takes me away from one of my values, which is disseminating acceptance and commitment skills for fear-based struggles. So this distinction between effective and ineffective, adaptive and maladaptive, helpful and unhelpful planet safe moves is very important because no human walks in life without experiencing some form of a fear-based emotion in some color, in some shape, in some size, and without playing it safe. To be human is to be anxious. To be human is to play it safe. So in this episode, I share with you a conversation I had with Dr. Diana Hill about playing it safe moves in regard to bodily-based sensations. I don't know if you had had panic attacks, But I can tell you, panic attacks are extremely uncomfortable. 
I remember that my first panic attack happened when I was driving back to the city from a camping trip. I was on the freeway and I started having shortness of breath. My whole body got very, very warm. I started hyperventilating. My heart was beating really fast. And I had to pull over because those sensations were extremely uncomfortable. Now, at that time, I didn't know acceptance and commitment skills. What I knew is that that experience, that panic attack was extremely awful. So in our life, we are going to have times in which our heart beats fast, in which we have butterflies in the stomach, in which our legs are shaking. But what happens if we play it safe every time we have one of those physical sensations or a bunch of them? If you practice sports, if you are a bike rider, if you are a jogger, if you run marathons, if you like to go for a scuba diving, you're also going to experience some form of bodily based reactions. If you play it safe, every time you experience one of those sensations, then it's going to be really hard for you to do something that is fun, that you care about. In this episode, Diana and I chat about all these playing it safe based responses to fear-based reactions that are primarily focused in our body. We both share different tips for you to step back, for you to slow down and for you to recognize what's going on in your body. We also talk about different ways for you to tap into these physical sensations and check what are these sensations pushing you to do. What is the playing it safe move that these sensations are asking you to do? Is that playing it safe move helpful or unhelpful? And close to the end of the conversation, Diana and I chat about how you can practice kindness and self-compassion when feeling anxious, when feeling scared, when feeling overwhelmed with a very, very big emotion or a very big sensation. You see, I think that many times we dismiss the fact or forget that managing our fears, worries, and anxieties is hard. That when we are scared, when we are anxious, when we are worried, we are doing the best we can to handle those annoying experiences in a moment. So what about if instead of spending hours and hours criticizing yourself, you listen to some tips to treat yourself with gentleness when feeling anxious, when feeling scared, and when feeling worried. Something to think about. If you have any comments or curiosities, please send me an email. My email is drz at thisisdrz.com. You can also follow me on Instagram. My IG handle is Dr. Z, Passionate Behaviorist. I know it's a very silly handle, but that's my handle. And lastly, I want to remind you that if you go to the website, this is drz.com, you can subscribe to the newsletter, Playing It Safe. And every week you can receive actionable, compassionate and evidence-based skills based on acceptance and commitment therapy to stop living in your head and start doing what matters. I hope you subscribe and see you next week. Bye-bye. I was thinking that for today, maybe we can talk about these playing it safe moves that a lot of us have when we get scared of bodily sensations. For example, when I think about fear-based struggles, 
when a person experiences a panic attack, which I had many in my life, they're very uncomfortable. Your heart starts beating fast and you have shortness of breath and you're afraid of losing control. And then as a natural response, we avoid anything that may have triggered those reactions. If I had a panic attack when taking the elevator, I may avoid taking the elevator. Or if I have a panic attack when I had a blood test, I may avoid going back to the doctor. The challenge is that we develop this aversive response to bodily sensations that are part of our day-to-day -day life. Because throughout the day, our body is making all types of noise, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little bit. And I would love to chat how you tackle those fear-based reactions to bodily responses. I think panic attacks are one example, but there's many other types mm -hmm. of bodily sensations that mm -hmm. people can get uncomfortable with. And, and what's interesting is I think it can go both ways. We could either do avoidance mm -hmm. or we can get completely engulfed in where it's almost, so for something uh, like with panic, we can also get so focused on the bodily sensation is that all that we feel are our flushed cheeks mm -hmm. or all that we feel are the constriction in our throat, right? Mm -hmm. And I have this, you know, a history of working with eating disorders for a long time. Mm -hmm. So another bodily sensation that I've worked a lot with people around is discomfort around fullness or discomfort mm -hmm. around hunger. Mm -hmm. For some people, there's bodily sensations like uh, sexual feelings that they may feel, oh no, when that shows up, I feel really uncomfortable. I need to avoid. So um, I, you know, for me, it boils down to um, looking at that model of mm -hmm. avoidance, either avoidance or trying to control. Mm -hmm. um, but also I get really interested in working with people around interoceptive awareness and really flexible interoception. I see many times, yeah, we think about these aversive somatic responses only in the context of anxiety, but there are many other struggles like problematic eating behaviors or when people are athletes and they're performing a high level of sports, they're going to experience pain in their muscles, fatigue, exhaustion. They're going to feel thirsty. Those are physical sensations that can also be aversive for a person. And then their mind may tell them like, you have to stop, you have to stop running. And with that addition, let me just go back to you so we can chat about interoception. How do you see it? What do you think of it? Well, so interoception is one type of perception. So we have exteroception, our awareness of the world around us. So you can mm -hmm. touch something right now. You can use your eyes to see something. You can smell something. And then we have our proprioception, which is our awareness of our body and space. So if I were to, you know, kind of put my arms out to the side, I know that there's a table over here and, uh, you know, a couch over here. And I kind of have a sense of how mm -hmm. far I can reach my arms before mm -hmm. I touch something, right? And the, the uh, interoception is awareness of what's happening inside of our bodies, the sensations mm -hmm. that are happening. So it could be everything from awareness of your heart beating to awareness of your hunger levels to awareness of your tiredness levels. And what happens is, is when, when we perceive something, our um, information from inside of our body goes up to our insula, information from our outside of our body, all that information goes up to other parts of our brain and it all gets integrated into our understanding of our experience. Mm -hmm. Many of us have um, sort of either underdeveloped interoception, like we don't even know what's happening in our bodies. How many times yeah. would I talk to somebody that's been like on diets for years and years and years. And I say like, well, what are you hungry for? Or how do you know if you're hungry? And they say, I don't know if, if unless I'm being told what to eat, I don't even know if I'm hungry or full. Mm -hmm. Or we have a over, over focus on what's happening in our bodies. Like all we can focus is on our chronic pain spot. And, yeah. and, and that is just like my migraine is dominating my whole experience or my back pain. Yeah. And so with flexible interoception or, or what I try and work with clients around is helping clients be able to open up and allow for sensations to happen within the body, mm -hmm. be able to respond to sensations when sensations are, are calling for us, you know, mm -hmm. whether that's, um, I need to rest or, um, I want to, I meant this body needs to move, right. Mm -hmm. But not suppress them get too cognitive about them, um, try to think our way out of them, 
or get so engulfed in them that we've lost that flexibility of being able to respond to our environment, be able to move our body towards our values. So the athlete can feel the discomfort in the knee and maybe keep running Mm -hmm. or the athlete will stop running because they're aware of the discomfort in the knee. If they keep running on it, it's going to damage the knee, right? So Mm -hmm. you be able to make the decision using that as information. Mm -hmm. And if a person that is listening to us is trying to develop this awareness of what's happening in their body, what Mm -hmm. would you encourage them to do? Um, I don't think I ever had a class or someone told me, Patricia, slow down and check what's showing up in your body. Can Mm -hmm. you scan your body from the head to the toes and see what's happening? I think before psychology, I was this human being just moving in life, but without really slowing down and checking what was happening inside. These days is different. So I think that's perhaps a norm for a lot of people. So what would you encourage our listeners to to develop awareness of what's happening in their body? What are tiny micro skills they can use? Yeah. Um, The first thing is that uh, our, our, our visual cortex dominates um, a huge part of our, of our brain and that, of that exteroception. So it's really helpful. If you want to get into your body, one thing that can be really helpful is closing your eyes. Um, mm-hmm. you know, even just, you'll see sometimes when people are uh, eating a really good meal, they'll close their eyes and chew. Have you mm-hmm. seen someone do that? You're just like, mm. Mm. or, you know, when, when you're feeling something really good, you just close your eyes for a moment and just feel it. Mm-hmm. Well, part of that is you, you instinctively know, I better turn out this visual cortex so I can tune in to what's happening. Mm-hmm. So some people don't find closing their eyes helpful, but for me, I find that really helpful is I'll just, even if it's just a micro close, I've just closed my eyes. Does that help me feel what's inside of my body? Mm-hmm. And the, the next step to that of like feeling inside of our bodies is maybe starting with feelings, feeling things that are easier to feel. Mm -hmm. So some things that may be easier to feel, um, are something like placing your hands somewhere on your body, because Mm -hmm. actually putting your hand, um, on your chest or putting your hand on your, on your belly brings your awareness or attention to that area. Mm -hmm. And then you can feel that area just moving. Sometimes movement within the body is the the easiest thing to feel. Like I can feel my body moving on the outside, but can I also feel the body moving on the inside? Mm-hmm. and slowing down. Mm-hmm. So those would be sort of the, the, the first three steps of, of having a little bit more just like, okay, I'm just kind of going to close my eyes for a minute. I'm going to put my hands somewhere in my body mm-hmm. and I'm going to feel from the inside out. Noticing the breath is often one of the, the places that people like to like to begin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for such a rich response. It's a lovely advice for people listening to us and I will certainly try them. If I can ask a little bit more, if we can go back to these first micro skills you you share with us, closing your eyes, placing your hand in one area of your body, whether that's your chest or your belly, and then slowing down. While I was listening to you, I can visualize myself practicing them because I am by myself at home, or at the end of the day, or maybe as a way to start my day. But I'm curious if I am walking on the street and there is a lot of noise, there is people talking, maybe I'm walking by a park and the kids are playing. How can people develop this interoceptive awareness? What would you advise them to do? Given that there is a lot of auditory and visual stimuli around us, but that doesn't mean that we cannot tap into what's happening to our bodies. So what would you encourage them to do? So people can do this in their day-to-day lives when they're walking in the streets or taking the train or taking the bus. So the skill that we just taught was sort of a two eyes in, mm-hmm. you know, closing your eyes, turning your eyes inside, what's happening in my body right now. And you're right. We can't walk around with our hand on our heart and our eyes closed. We'll bump into things. <laughs> Um, we need to have our eyes open in our life. And so the, the, the next step of that is you practice, mm-hmm. we do need to practice the eyes closed exercise. And so the eyes closed exercise is everything from, if you have a hard time noticing if you're hungry or full, eat a meal without distractions mm-hmm. so that you don't have the TV on and you don't have 
um, you know, somebody else, eat a meal alone and pay attention. So that's a two eyes in moment. And we do need to practice that to get better at the next step, which is one eye in and one eye out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's a toggle. So one eye in and one eye out is I'm walking in the street. I'm rushed. I'm late for work. There's a lot of stimulation. I need to get there. And usually at that point in time, my head is running the show and I'm just see, and I'm my, I'm just seeing the world around me. I'm a go, go, go. Mm -hmm. Being able to anchor back into one eye in and one eye out would be, I'm aware of all that happening. Yeah. And then I'm also aware of the feeling of rushed in my body. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is rushed. And sometimes it's just a one eye in tapping it like, okay, rushed and, and labeling it. We know that labeling our emotion is very helpful for regulating our emotion, mm -hmm. but in order to label your emotion or what's going on, you need to have interoceptive awareness. You need to know what's mm -hmm. happening in your body to be able to give it a label. Mm -hmm. So labeling, just making contact with, okay, this is rushed. That's all. You don't need to change rushed. You don't need to fix rushed, but just tap in. This is rushed or this is anxious. It, it, I'm feeling anxiety in my, in my chest. I'm noticing, or even better would be, I'm feeling constriction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that we start to turn our eyes in. Sometimes we will respond in that moment of, okay, I want to go into my mm -hmm. meeting with a feeling more centered. So I'm going to respond to that body need by slowing my walking down and walk the rest of the way mm -hmm. um, instead of rushing the rest of the way. Yeah. I love this addition that you're making because I think we need to have private practice and public practice. Um, many times when I'm going over these skills with my clients, they feel like they're simplistic. And the reality is that as you are pinpointed, there is a lot of research showing how slowing down and labeling our affect actually can help us to have a better chances to choose our behavior instead of just going on and on with emotions. If I can ask a little bit, so I have one sassy question and I have another non-sassy question. Which one do you want? <laughs> did, you, did you say saucy? Sassy, yes. I said. Ooh, I want, I want saucy. <laughs> okay, let's go for it. Let's see how we do. <laughs> yeah. So I was having a conversation with Oliver Buckerman. He Ooh, is. I, I know who he is. I am all about 4,000 weeks. Yes. I know, amazing. I can't believe you got to talk to him. He's amazing, yeah. An incredible human being, and it was such a treat to have a chance to talk to him. I love his work. For people who are listening to us, he's a journalist who has a column in The Guardian and has published two books. The first book is called The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the second book, the latest one, is 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. He's a very interesting journalist and very science-based, and his journey to self-help is fascinating. But in one of his articles, this is maybe years ago, he was questioning what emotions are. And one way that I can capture one of the arguments he's making is by asking ourselves, what are emotions without physical sensations? So if we think about emotions, we're always tapping into how they feel and they sense in our body. Once we label the physical sensation, let's say my heart beating fast, tingling sensation in my legs, some pressure on my chest, that's a sensation. And then we may say that's sadness, that's anger, that's hope. So in one of his articles, he was questioning what are emotions without the physical sensations? What do you think? I think it's a very sassy question. It's a very provoking one. I, I think it's not provoking at all because if, okay. if you have a child, mm -hmm. you know that because children have emotions before they can put words to what they are for quite a while. Mm. And, um, and one of the things that, that, they, that I work with my kids around when, when we're working on emotional awareness early on is I don't ask them, tell me, are you, you, know, are you anxious or are you sad? Or I ask them point to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. where, where are you feeling that in your body? Is it, is it up yeah. here or is it yeah. down here? And yeah. what does it feel like? And is it moving? And, and, and what is yeah. it, what is it, how, how does it make you want to move, you know, yeah. and, and show it to me and draw it for me. And, and they very much our, our emotions are, are, are in our bodies and yes. there's an emphasis on one form of attention 
in our society, which is the prefrontal cortex kind of attention, Mm -hmm. which is the uh, attention that you have when, when you're writing a paper or you're writing a book and you can keep that sustained attention for a very long time. But there's another form of attention that's undervalued within, within our society that is just as important, which is the attention of the insula, which pays attention to things like what's happening, the, the information that's in my body. Mm-hmm. The insula is what is um, activated more in meditators, long-term meditators. When, when they meditate, you see activation in the insula. Yeah. When you see people that are experiencing empathy for another person, you see activation in the, empath- in the insula. And it's mm-hmm. lower in, um, in the brain. Yeah. So let me be a little bit sassier again. Yeah. If an emotion starts with what we sense in our body, why do we need emotions? So I do exactly the same thing you're saying. When I'm trying to help people to develop emotional awareness, I start by asking them to describe what they're noticing in their body what they are sensing in their body, whether that's a tingling sensation, a painful pressure, whatever it is, because the emotion starts in our body. But what is the construct of emotion if you remove the physical sensation? What is sadness we have having shortness of breath? What is panic without my heart beating fast? What is anger without me frowning? I don't think it exists. That's what is interesting, right? Yeah. So emotions yeah. are constant that we're giving. We're adding yeah. to physical sensations. We talk a lot about emotional awareness and emotional training mm-hmm. and emotional IQ. Mm-hmm. But if we unpack every emotion, it starts with a physical sensation. And the physical sensation comes with an action urge. It pushes me to do something. And then we gave that sensation an emotion name. But do we have to do that? No, I don't think so. I think sometimes we can just have awareness of the sensation itself. A lot of times they're more, it's more complex. Much more complex. It's like, yeah, more diverse. Yeah. And you sort of like the diagnostic system, right? Sometimes the diagnosis helps and sometimes it hurts, right? Because it takes oversimplifies something or puts it into some kind of, this is normal. This is not. Yeah. I'm sure we have seen both of us clients that struggle identifying or labeling emotions. Let's think about alexithymia. When people have a difficulty recognizing their emotions, let's think about people who have neurocognitive struggles. Let's think about Asperger's or high functioning autism, in which perhaps trying to teach them to label an emotion is much harder than noticing what's showing up in their body. So for people listening to us, well, we encourage people to identify their emotional state. And you have these beautiful tips to help people develop the emotional awareness. We also want to be flexible. If people cannot label their emotional state like anger, sadness, they can still recognize what they are sensing in their body and what is that physical sensation pushing them to do. Absolutely. I mean, even just this, this and kind of feeling into my body right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I were to check into the different sensations in my body, there's sort of an uneasiness that kind of is running in the back of my throat down to the middle space of my body, mm-hmm. sort of like a, like kind of like a revved car feeling like you're mm-hmm. pushing on the, and, um, if I were to try and label that uneasiness mm-hmm. right now, it would take me out of that part of my body and into my head. Mm-hmm. So if I were to just pay attention to the sensation of that revved feeling behind the back of my throat into my heart, and I were, it kind of, it's kind of in the middle of my body, not as much at the front or the back, but really kind of central. And I were to relax around it with my belly, because oftentimes mm-hmm. we tense around the uneasiness or we tense up with, we physically tense, not mm-hmm. only um, tense in terms of trying to overthink things then I can allow it to be there and still have a conversation with you. And then I can check in around it. I'm like, huh, mm-hmm. am I, do I have a little, hmm, that in the uneasiness started to show up when you started talking about this book for a thousand weeks. Mm-hmm. Like, why, why is that there? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, 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 because, and I could psychoanalyze all of that, but I don't need to pay attention to that right now. I can save that for later and I can still stay present when I'm mm-hmm. talking with you. Mm -hmm. So that's where I just feel like the sensations, our body has way more intelligence Mm -hmm. 
yeah. than um, we allow for. I mean, honestly, our body wants to seek homeostasis. Our body can do amazing things to heal itself. I went to talk to a, um, a doctor that uh, he worked, he was worked with diabetes, he was an endocrinologist, mm-hmm. worked with diabetes. And he was like, I would rather fly an airplane with zero experience ever flying a plane mm-hmm. than ever try and operate the pancreas. Wow. <laughs> And yet your body operates the pancreas every single day. So, you know, I, and this, this was an expert on the pancreas, right? So I feel like that, um, you know, our body gets a short shift, but in the same time, we just interpret body and sensations as scary. Yes. Yes. And, and we don't, you know, it's like, wait a minute here, your body's on your own side here. It's doing what it's supposed to do, but we Mm -hmm. interpret it, um, is scary so often. As bad, right? Something As bad. that we have to fix. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing how it looks to recognize and tap into your body. When you step back, slow down. If I can ask a little bit, when that sensation of uneasiness show up in your body, what was the action urge? What was that sensation pushing you to do? Is that something important for our audience? When they tap into this physical sensation, let's check. What is this sensation pushing you to do? What would you say, Diana? What was that uneasiness asking you to do? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think there's two questions there is what, what, what do I want to do to the uneasiness? Sure. And then what is the uneasiness pushing to do? So, so I'll I'll answer the first one. What I want to do to the uneasiness is make it go away. (laughs) So so that's what it's like, oh, I just want to shut that down because I don't like feeling uneasy. So I'd like to like tune that out, shut it off, make it stop. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what is the uneasiness pushing me to do? Um, I think, you know, in that moment, it it was um, an uneasiness around like, oh, no, you're going to ask me a question that I don't have a good answer for. And you're going to reference this book that I read out of pleasure, but didn't read to prepare for this interview. And so the uneasiness is like, ooh, be on alert and, and perform well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so for me, uneasiness is often a driver. Mm-hmm. It like, it wants me to, to um, pay attention and be, and be alert because there's something uh, of danger coming. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I absolutely love your response because that's the part that many times we don't realize. The physical sensations, back slash emotions always come with an action urge that push us to do something. But then as you were answering, then we can choose how do we want to handle this sensation? What do I want to do in this moment? And that leads me to my second question. This question is about how many times we get stuck in our heads, making sense of our bodies. And as you say moments ago, I wish we can stay much more present with what's showing up in our bodies, but the mind plays tricks. In my work, I have found that people usually do three things with uncomfortable emotional experiences they have. One, they ruminate about it. Why am I feeling this? Why am I sensing this? Why is my heart beating so fast? Many times they judge the experience. This is bad. I don't want to feel this. And the third response is trying to replace it quickly, right? If I notice that my heart is beating fast, I may try to do something to replace that. Sometimes that can include thinking something positive, having an image of something soothing right away. So just to recap, these three responses are three ways in which people play it safe. They are ruminating about the physical experience or the emotional experience. They are judging it as something bad or as a threat, or they are trying to replace it quickly. If any of our listeners are engaging in those responses, and quite likely people are, because I do that too many times, that's what the mind does, What would you encourage or invite them to do? Let's say for the first one, if people are judging the physical experience as something that is a threat, that is dangerous, and that is bad, what would you encourage them to do in those moments? Mm, Can I tell a little story? Yes, please. We welcome stories. Yeah. So so I went on a retreat with um, Jack Kornfield, and Mm. he's um, a loving kindness meditation teacher. And one of the things that he um, 
it was, it was like sort of early on the tree and, and we're, we're doing a, a seated practice just to be quiet with ourselves. Mm. And he said, you know, what often happens when you're in seated practice is you start to feel restless. And then all of a sudden that restlessness, and we were on this beautiful retreat, like in Costa Rica with like the ocean and the everything. Wow. Right. And, um, and he said, you know, what happens is, um, is you get this restless feeling and then the restless feeling starts to go make bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you start judging the, oh, why am I restless? I, I hate this. Rest this restlessness always shows up. I wish this restless, restlessness could go away. I'm on retreat in Costa Rica and here's the restlessness. Right. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, we, we do that. That's what the mind does. But in that moment, what if you were just to say, take me now restlessness. I'll be the first person to die of restlessness on retreat with Jack Cornfield in Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> because that is what our mind does. Our mind goes to judgment and this is dangerous and this is bad. And whether it's restlessness on retreat in Costa Rica or it's a panic <laughs> symptom in the middle of Trader Joe's. I mean, I've, I've worked with clients with that or all sorts of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, that we can actually let go and lean in or lean back, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. lean in or lean back, whichever, whichever version works for you to really just sort of almost like, I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to fight it. Here it is. Mm -hmm. And when we start from, and, and when we do that, then all of a sudden your meditation will be um, much better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so will your experience in Trader Joe's and you can just bring your panic symptoms with you. So I think the first thing is just to notice that's what our mind tends to do and that unhook from it by almost doing the opposite of what the mind wants to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing this story. Um, I was visualizing every single thing you were saying. I think when the judgment comes, perhaps the micro skill there is to let go of fighting against and let in the experience. I'm sensing this restlessness or this uneasiness. So for people listening to us, that's something to try. If they are experiencing an uncomfortable physical sensation or uncomfortable emotional state, and the mind is judging that as something dangerous, as something they have to do something about, let that physical experience take you with it. Just let it be there and just stop the fight. Now, what if a person is ruminating or let's say replacing, they are quickly trying to replace these uncomfortable physical experiences with something soothing what would you encourage them to do in those moments? So there's two answers to this. I think there's something to do not in those moments, which is to take a look at how effective that is in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, so the example that's often used that I will use again, it's so trite, mm -hmm. it's been used so many times, but I experienced it personally so many times, which is the toddler in the grocery store that's having the tantrum for the candy bar. You mm -hmm. know what's going to happen if you want to replace that tantrum with the candy bar for your kid. Mm -hmm. The kid will the kid will get quiet pretty quickly, and then next time you go to um, the grocery store, is the kid more or less likely to have that tantrum, <laughs> right? And how's how early on will, will will the tantrum happen? Like a little bit even earlier on in the grocery experience than later on because they know that a candy bar is coming. So we have our own version of that for ourselves, and in some ways, an uncomfortable sensation shows up, and we we know the things everyone has their flavor of what gets rid of it, mm -hmm. and that could be a Xanax, and that could be picking up your phone, and that's just experiential avoidance. We all do it, sure. and it's fine if it works for you, mm -hmm. but it's not workable when it makes the, um, the experience worse over time, or when you are missing out on some other important thing in your life, because you're so bu busy suppressing, um, that feeling. Mm -hmm. So that's what you do. You get, you get sort of like, how is this working for me outside uh, of the moment? <laughs> Don't do that when you're in the moment, because <laughs> trying to argue with the mom in the uh, grocery store about why she shouldn't give her kid a candy bar, you're going to get a gut punch. <laughs> She's like, I'm just giving him a candy bar. You don't know what it's like to be married me right now. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so yeah, so you don't want to do that in the moment, in the moment mm. when, when you are, when you is, is, is to, to pause mm -hmm. and be with, mm -hmm. and I would add be with, with compassion, mm. Mm. compassion for yourself, mm -hmm. compassion for how hard this is. Mm -hmm. Can I make space in my body for everything that's showing up? We all have our version of that moment and of, of the discomfort and our version of that thing 
that we've picked up so many times. Mm -hmm. We just want to pick up one more time to escape it. Mm -hmm. What's cool is if you ride that wave, it, it, it doesn't stay that intense forever. So mm -hmm. we know that all sensations will rise up to a peak and they'll come back down. And guess what? They'll come back again. Um, that's the nature of our sensations. This wave is going to pass whether I act on it or not. Mm -hmm. This wave will pass. Those would mm -hmm. be some questions. That's beautiful. I strongly encourage people listening to us to try that. I love what you say, Diana. Be with it with compassion, whatever that it is. Thank you so much for sharing that wisdom. The last planet safe move that people do when dealing with uncomfortable physical sensations or emotional experiences ruminate. Why I'm having this feeling? Why is my heart breathing fast? And then they're also dwelling on the meaning of that experience. Does it mean that I'm losing control? Does it mean I'm going to have a heart attack? Does it mean that this is how it's going to be forever? So for people who are ruminating, what could they do in the moment in which the mind is going on and on, trying to make sense of this experience and spending hours and hours hyper-focusing on it? Yeah. Yeah. Ruminating sort of a, um, is reinforcing. You know, we think that we're, it makes us feel like we're doing something about it, oh, right? No. If, if I'm ruminating about it. And so it has this reinforcing quality to it. Um, and we know that it, you know, sends us in cycles. It's sort of like um, getting deeper into the fight with your spouse or your partner in the middle of the night, and you just keep on fighting and fighting and fighting. And really, um, the person that wins is, is the person that says, let's just go to bed and wake up the next morning. We have fresh perspective on this because it's getting worse the later <laughs> mm -hmm. it gets. That's mm -hmm. the nature of ruminating. Mm -hmm. It just gets worse the, the, digger you, the, the, the more you dig into it. And so that's where I feel like sometimes, am I, you know, getting out of the head, and um, getting into the moment, you know, it's helpful just to look at something that's not in our heads. Like, can I just notice outside right now? I'm looking outside and there's a um, cup of tea with a tea bag. And if I'm connecting to something outside of my head and that's present in the here and now, mm -hmm. it gives me a little bit more cognitive flexibility mm -hmm. because rumination is, is, a, is a stuck, you're, you're stuck in one form of cognition. But our mind has also the capability of, of, of seeing the world around us. And also there's all sorts of things outside of your head that may be of interest and mm -hmm. may be enjoyable or may be useful to pay attention to uh, versus going around the same loop over mm -hmm. and over again. That's beautifully said. I think one of the things that we know with rumination is that it's hard for people to catch it at times because it feels as a problem solving strategy. Um, in addition also to what you're suggesting, I think it's helpful for people to ask themselves, do I need to do something about these feelings right now? Do I really have to do something about it? Even though the thoughts will be, what's the meaning of this? Why I'm having this? Am I losing control? Productive problem solving requires an action, but many times rumination is so unproductive. There is nothing for us to do besides focusing in the present. Tayana, thank you so much for sharing all your insights and all these tips with our listeners. It's always such a pleasure to chat with you. And as usual, I have the last question, <laughs> which is today, who would you like to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or even a beer? You know, I just want to have a cup of coffee with my husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I just think that that's what's really been um, present for me in my life most recently is just the importance of, of these relationships that um, really serve as the foundation of, um, of the ground on which I, which I stand on and breathe. So I would like to sit down with him. That sounds lovely. And thank you for sharing that. I think sometimes we forget that the precious time that we have with the ones we love is impermanent. Thank you so much. I always feel very grateful for having a chance to chat with you. And I feel very appreciative of all what you share with our listeners. And of course, I hope to bring you back again in a couple of months. Oh, I would love that. I love talking with you. I feel like we're just, you know, kindred spirits, sisters in a lot of ways. Um, so I really love talking to you. Thank you for this conversation. I feel the same way. Thank you so much. 
Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, I will very much appreciate it if you will subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. And if you're feeling extra generous, I welcome a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes of this episode are in the website Playing It Safe, that's on. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so you can receive more tips to stop all types of unworkable Playing It Safe actions. See you soon!